Thank you, Alan and Kim, for reading that passage for us. Do you notice the pulpit is a little lower this morning? It's very nice to have an adjustable one with Pastor Dave on his, and his family on vacation. I brought my camera this morning, not because I want to take pictures of you, but uh, instead to let it serve as, an, as the outline for my message today. This camera has a telephoto lens. I can zoom out and make the focus very narrow. Uh, if I do that, I could see a few of your faces, but I couldn't see the wider audience. But when I pull the focus back, then I get the whole picture. When it's a narrow focus like this, I might be able to see a bird in a tree, but I wouldn't be able to see the whole tree. But when I pull it back, then I get the wider picture. In fact, could see the whole audience here. Life is like that, I think. And I think the scenes that we see here in Genesis 37 regarding the early life of Joseph are like that. So this morning, I want us to look at this chapter first through the narrow angle lens or perspective, looking at the events one at a time in their own individual setting. And when we do that, we learn something about sin, how sin is a vicious chain of events that goes from bad to worse. But then after we look through that narrow angle lens at these events, I want us to look at these same events through the wide-angle lens and see the big picture. And when we do that, we see something very wonderful. And we are assured of the marvelous sovereignty and providence of God in turning even bad things into good results. So let's take our camera this morning and first look at Genesis 37 through the narrow angle lens, focusing individually on the events themselves without regard to the wider picture. So uh, in your bulletin notes there, you can follow along the narrow angle lens or perspective, first of all. When we look at Genesis 37 this way, it's not a happy chapter but it is an instructive one on the nature of sin, what sin is like. Sin is a progressive thing. It goes from bad to worse. It's a vicious chain of events in which one sin leads to another, and the farther one progresses along this chain, the more enslaved that person becomes. Look at the sin chain in this chapter. It has five links. The first link of this chain is favoritism. Verse 3. Now Israel, or Jacob, that's the term by which Jacob is known here. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him a richly ornamented robe. Isn't it interesting how parental traits tend to repeat themselves in their children? Remember one of the causes for the great antagonism between Jacob and his brother Esau when they were growing up. It was the fact that his parent, their parents, Isaac and Rebekah, played favorites. Genesis 25, 28 says that Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. This set the two boys against each other, and it was years before they were finally reconciled. But here, when Jacob is old, or grows old, he's making the same mistake. He's following, he's showing favoritism to one son over the rest. It's sobering for us to realize as parents 
that we are modeling the future habits of our children for good or for bad by the example that we set before them, that we live before them. I mean, our children are very likely to do much like we do. Not always, of course, but more often than not. So it's a very big order to live as parents in front of our children. Jacob gave Joseph a special coat. The King James Version translates it as a coat of many colors. NIV calls it a richly ornamented robe. Whatever the significance of this special robe or coat, it showed Jacob's intent to elevate Joseph to a higher level than his brothers. It clearly showed Jacob's favoritism for Joseph. Parents, do not, I repeat, do not play favorites among your children. That's a cardinal sin of parenthood. And it's likely to trigger the same reaction by the other children toward the favored one or ones as we see here in Genesis 37. I suppose Jacob felt that he had reason to love Joseph more than his other sons. It says so in verse 4, because he had been born to him in his old age. But whatever the tendency or temptation to favor one child over another, uh, parents uh, squelch it. <laughs> Don't let it happen. Showing favoritism is an almost certainly way, certain way to sow discord within a family. So that's the first link in this ch uh, chain of sin in uh, this chapter. The second link is jealousy. Hatred is actually the one mentioned in, next in verse 4, but I'm quite sure that jealousy preceded hatred and led to it. Verse 11 plainly says his brothers were jealous of him, that is, of Joseph. You see, one sin led to another. Favoritism provoked the rest of Jacob's sons to jealousy. It's a normal reaction, of course, a sinful reaction, but a normal one, being the fallen children of Adam that we are. I mean, his brothers were at fault for being jealous, of course. Nobody can plead extenuating circumstances uh, when it comes to this sin, to sins of the heart like this. Nor can we blame somebody else for our sins. But Jacob also had a hand in provoking them to jealousy. Sin is not just a private affair, because our sins often prompt others to sin as well. That's part of this whole vicious cycle or chain of sin that we might start and that others might continue. Jealousy is a sin greatly to be feared, greatly to be feared, because it's it's usually, it usually leads to something else. Jealousy hardly ever stops with itself. It almost always gives birth to another sin, like we see it doing here in the third link of this chain of sin. May I just at this point say that if you are conscious in your heart of any sin of jealousy or envy toward someone else, Root it out. I mean, confess it to God and be willing to give it up because jealousy is poison, far more poisonous than we often realize. Notice what it led here, uh, led to here in Genesis 37. The third link in this vicious chain is hatred. Verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him, that is, Joseph, more than any of them, they hated him could not speak a kind word to him. And then something happens that fuels the fire all the more. Verses 5 through 8, Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose, uh, rose and stood upright, and your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Uh-oh. Oh, oh boy. That didn't help things, did it? His brothers said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? 
and they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Verse 6, then he had another dream. <laughs> and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And this time even his father Jacob got fed up. <laughs> and uh, verse 10 says, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Well, let's give Joseph the benefit of the doubt and assume that it was just youthful immaturity that led him to tell about his dreams in the way he did. There was a prophetic element to them, of course, as time would tell, but sometimes there are things better left unsaid, at least for the moment. And I think these would have been better left unsaid. By telling his dreams, Joseph just stirred the pot all the more. This kid brother of ours. Uh, first, he's dad's pet, and that's bad enough. Now he's telling us we're going to be his servants. He says they hated him all the more. You see, things are, getting, are going from... They're getting worse and worse. The farther the sin chain goes, the brothers are getting deeper and deeper into a situation that is becoming out of control very fast. I mean, turn around, brothers, before it's too late. But they just keep going farther and farther in this vicious chain of sin. They're possessed by hatred now, the Bible says that they've as good as murdered Joseph already in their hearts. 1 John 3.15 says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. That's what hatred does. Once I heard someone say, I hate so-and-so. And then he went on to say, I don't want to forgive that man. Maybe on my deathbed, but not now. I don't want to forgive him. If any of us this morning have an attitude anything like that toward anyone, I mean, get rid of it. Plead with God for forgiveness and deliverance from the terrible sin of hatred before it drives you to something even farther, as we see it did in this chapter. Hatred led to the fourth link in this violent chain sin, namely crime or a criminal act. You know the story as it was just read by Alan and Kim. Joseph's brothers are away grazing their flocks. Jacob sends Joseph to see how they are doing. And verses 18 through 20 say, but they saw him in the distance and before he reached them they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other, Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal has devoured him. Then we'll see what happens, what comes of his dreams. They would have actually killed him were it not for Reuben, who was able to convince the other brothers to throw Joseph alive into a pit instead of killing him. We have sympathy for Reuben here. He wasn't strong enough to stem the tide of his brother's hatred, but uh, he did want to do the right thing, or at least a better thing. And even though his plan failed, Reuben's heart was not as wicked as, his, as the other brothers. Well, they end up selling Joseph instead to a caravan of slave traders who were on their way to Egypt, and so the crime was committed. Jealousy and hatred are sins of attitude, sins of the heart. We don't see those sins. Other people don't see those sins within us very often because they're, they're inside sins. But sooner or later, these sins of the heart are likely to come out in the form of overt, outward acts of sin as well. We cannot secretly allow or nourish sins like hatred, jealousy, lust, and so on, without gradually becoming so enslaved by these inward sins 
that they eventually show themselves in actions also. I mean, unless we root them out, they begin to control us more and more, and they produce outward acts like we see here in the brother's hatred finally issuing in criminal behavior. And that leads us to the fifth link in this sin chain of events in Genesis 37, deceit. This, of course, is an entirely predictable follow-on from the wrongdoing and crime, the attempt to cover it up. That's what criminals do. Verses 31 through 33, then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped, it in the, dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. They didn't even say our brother's robe. They said your son's robe. <laughs> Joseph rec Jacob recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Wrongdoers typically try to cover their tracks by deceit. But the Bible promises that this will never work. Numbers 32, 23 says, Be sure your sin will find you out. <laughs> the brothers experienced this a number of years later when all of this eventually came to light. Be sure your sin will find you out. Sometimes that happens almost right away. Sometimes it doesn't happen until much later, but it's sure to happen. How many times in political circles, when candidates' lives are examined very minutely, have we, haven't we often, so often heard of, of sins in their past, even decades ago, long ago, which come to light and sabotage them? years later. Be sure your sin will find you out. And even if it never happens in this life, justice won't fail because there's one sure net that no unrepentant sinner can ever escape. And that's the final net of God's judgment in the life to come. The Bible says in the final conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes, the last verse of that book, when the preacher had clearly seen the whole picture, it says, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. That's the promise of scripture. Deceit is the natural follow-on of wrongdoing, but it can never cover sin forever. Well, that's the end of the vicious chain of sin in Genesis 37. And the final result of it all is great grief. Verse 34 and into verse 35. Then jo Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. The chain had gone full circle. It's back to Jacob. The person who, in one sense, in one sense only, but in one sense started it all by his mistake of favoritism. The end of the sin chain is always grief. And the only way to get rid of that grief is by submitting the whole chain to the grace of God's forgiveness. And thankfully, that very thing is possible. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he, that is God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is the great relief. That's the relief from grief and freedom from the sin chain. Put it under the blood of Christ through confession to God. Is there anything that you and I need to put under the blood of Christ this morning? Anything we need to confess to God and ask for his forgiveness? If there is, let's do it. And break the sin chain before it goes any farther. Well, those are some lessons we learn from about sin. <laughs>
when we view this chapter through the narrow angle lens perspective. We see a bunch of individual sins all adding up to guilt and extreme grief. But now, let me pull the lens back and look at things through the wide angle perspective. Genesis 37 is a gloomy chapter if you just look at the individual events themselves. And if we do only that, we miss something very wonderful. When we, when we look through the wide-angle lens, we see the sovereignty and the providence of God at work in a remarkable way. In spite of all these sins, God is at work fulfilling his good purpose. Now, let's not make a mistake. God did not want these sins to happen. They were bad things. God was not pleased with those sins. Of course not. And God did not cause those sins in any active way. Again, of course, of course not. But the encouraging thing is that in spite of all those sins, God was working through the tragedy of Joseph's life to turn the history of his people Israel in exactly the direction it needed to be turned. I mean, the whole history of redemption, the redemption which you and I have inherited today, the whole history of that redemption was being developed by God right here in Genesis 37 and on through Genesis 50 and following. We have a marvelous God. He's got the whole world in his hands. And nothing can defeat his eternal purpose. In fact, God can turn everything, even bad things, into good results. The life of Joseph is a beautiful Old Testament example of the truth of Romans 8.28 in the New Testament. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28 doesn't say that everything is good. Most of the things in Genesis 37 were bad. But God works all things together. He works all things out for the good of those who are willing to be clay in his hands. He takes even bad things and turns them into good results in the lives of his children of his chosen ones. Think of Genesis 50 and verse 20, which happened a number of years after Genesis 37. There Joseph, who was now the ruler, a, the chief ruler of Egypt, speaks to his brothers when they are fearful that now that Joseph has power, he's going to take revenge upon us for what we did. But Genesis 50, 20 says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what was now being done, the saving of many lives. Genesis 50, 20 is the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament. But we don't see that until we look through our wide-angle lens and see that perspective, that overall perspective. We see the whole picture. Then we see the master planner at work. God. Now this has great implications for our lives and for our ability to face things from our past as well as to face things that come into our lives right now and will come into our lives in the future. God can take tragedies, mistakes, handicaps, past sinful things in our lives and turn them into good results, something beautiful. Take heart from that and always live with that in mind. Maybe there's something you did in the past. I think all of us have things like that. I know I do. And you say, oh, how I wish I had never done that. How I wish, if I could just go back and undo that thing. 
Well, if you've asked God to forgive you for any sin involved, and if you've made any restitution to others that is necessary or possible, then trust the God who can and who does turn bad things into good results and forgive yourself. I mean, God has forgiven you, so forgive yourself. Don't carry that thing around as a heavy burden anymore. God can turn even bad things, the bad things you and I have done, into good results. Trust him to do that and go free. It's a wonderful freeing thing to look at life that way. Or maybe you're on the receiving end of something, of some bad things. Maybe you're suffering from some handicap. Maybe a physical weakness or something. Or maybe some tragic thing has influenced your life in a sad way. Trust God who turns even bad things into good results in the lives of his children. What he is allowing you and I to experience may be exactly the thing that is needed for us to fulfill our intended purpose, uh, God's intended purpose for us. You probably know the name Johnny Erickson, Johnny Erickson Tada, her married name. Because of a diving accident when she was a teenager, Johnny became paralyzed from the neck down. A sad and tragic accident, it certainly seems. And yet God turned that accident into, into a means for Johnny to have a worldwide Christian ministry of speaking and writing, which has produced a huge radio outreach and over 45 published books. Almost certainly, we would have never heard of Johnny had it not been for that accident. But again, God turns even bad things into good results in the lives of his chosen ones. The Apostle Paul realized that too. Paul apparently had a physical handicap. He called it a thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Probably bad eyesight from the... Uh, few clues that we can get from Scripture, that would seem to be the case. Whatever it was, he said he asked the Lord three times to take it away, but it didn't happen. And then Paul realized something. Ah, God's grace is sufficient for me, so I'll rejoice. In fact, Paul was better off with his handicap than he would have been without it. God was turning it into good in Paul's life. If you happen to be facing something in your own life and, and that you find difficult, and you wonder why, uh, why God allows it, well, you can ask God to take it away. There's nothing wrong with that, with doing that. But if he doesn't take it away, then look at it through your wide-angle lens. And trust that God is using that difficulty for something good and beautiful. Better and more beautiful than you could be without it. It's liberating when we look at things that way. So I leave you with these two perspectives this morning on uh, Genesis 37. The narrow angle perspective warns us of the seriousness of sin. The wide-angle perspective reminds us of the sovereign providence of God in taking even bad things and turning them into good results for his children. May the Lord apply his word to our lives today in exactly the way we need it, for our encouragement and for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the great, great, great God you are. The God of all details. The God of every circumstance that comes into our lives. We put ourselves into your hands. We love you. And we trust then that you are indeed 
able, and not just able, but willing and not just willing, but certain to turn those bad things into good results, to make us exactly the kind of person that you want us to be. Thank you for this assurance. We thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen.